Friends, I'm Daniel Nesbitt, and this is Designing a Sans Serif Typeface. In this episode, I just wanted to do a little bit of wrap-up in this series, so uh, this video will probably be a little bit shorter than my previous ones, but uh, I figured this would be kind of a good way to end the Sans Serif that we've been working on here over the last uh, number of weeks here. Um, and just kind of tidy up a little bit about uh, what I would do next with this font if I were to release it. Now before I jump into things, I uh, actually wouldn't mind some input on that because right now I really don't know what to do with this. Um, this is a pretty basic character set. Uh, granted, we didn't go into a whole lot of detail in this series, but it does have, uh, I guess, a normal weight and a bold weight to it. And um, I, I've been debating on what I want to do. I don't know that I necessarily want to sell it. I think it's a little bit too basic for that. But um, I'm open to some ideas on that. So uh, if you haven't already, and I know I say this in every episode, but uh, feel free to jump in the comment section and uh, let me know what you think. Um, some ideas that I've had have included uh, a download file somewhere or potentially open sourcing it if anybody wants to play with the... Uh, the actual glyphs file instead of just the uh, OTF file. Um, but uh, maybe there's something else that I'm not thinking of. So if you have any ideas, uh, hit me up in the comment section below and let me know. And I guess while I'm already doing that whole uh, thing, uh, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button too if you haven't already. So we'll get that out of the way early. Um, but anyway, in this episode, uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about that I did not touch base um, in the uh, previous episode on kerning was actually something that Glyphs has that's super cool and super helpful. If you go under the Glyph tab, there is uh, an extension called KernCraft. And uh, unfortunately, this is one of those things that I did not really notice until I... Um, finished recording last week's episode, so I never really had the chance to play with it, much less talk about it in a video, but I figured I would talk about it here because I had mentioned one of the uh, important things when you're doing type is uh, to put it into proofs and to see how letters are, are spaced out, if you need to adjust tracking, if you need to adjust kerning, and that kind of thing. And uh, if you've been following along and doing that, you'll know that, I mean, you pretty much have to think of almost every single word combination uh, in your typeface, and that, that can be pretty daunting to do. Uh, but what I love about KernCraft, and I haven't dove into this too much to really talk about all of these settings here, um, but what you can do is you can select any letter out of your typeface here, and uh, if you open tab, I'm just going to let this run, so this is just the regular setup too, um, and this drop down here just refers to the masters that I have in the document right now, but if I do this and hit open tab, um, this is actually a really cool feature that's kind of fun to play with. So what this does, if I zoom out a little bit, is uh, it actually goes through and creates the combination for pretty much, I think, every single pair of letters, punctuation, and whatnot, but it's it's using what you've already built in your typeface. Uh, so in my case, I've got uppercase, I've got uh, lowercase as we get a little bit farther down here, and then further on it gets into numbers and punctuation. Now. If I had more, obviously this list would be a lot longer, but one thing that I really like about this is that in a very quick way, you're able to go through and uh, do things like current your typeface or space your typeface out. Um, I, I really like, and, and this is something that I had done in the past where I was typing out a couple H's or a couple N's or maybe a couple O's or that kind of thing. Um, but this is just a really handy way to go through and, and quickly get that built up um, and at a glance, you're able to see what might need work or uh, or if you're, if you're on the right track. So this is a handy little thing. Um, and, I mean, you have to go through, and maybe there's some out there who, who have a little bit more experience with this than I do. Um, but at least the way that i found right now is, is you've got to go through pretty much each character here and open a new tab for it to work. Um, one thing that I, I did mention was, uh, you know, when we were kerning, is that you're you're focusing a lot on your control characters to start, which, uh, if you need a, a quick uh, refresh on that, that was the cap O, the capital H, the lowercase n, and the lowercase o. And uh, I don't know that I would necessarily go through and do every single letter, um, you know, for things like the O or the C or the O and... Um, Oh, what else could I even think of here? Uh, even if it's just like one side, like the uh, the curved side of the B or the D or the P or the Q that would share a shape like that, where we can uh, create a link and, and to those kerning pairs and to those side bearings. I don't know that I would I would necessarily go through and take a look at those, but um, 
I just really think this is a useful tool for just kind of getting those control characters down and getting an idea for the flow and, and how it's working. Um, I also like this because you stay in glyphs. You're not jumping in glyphs and then going into Illustrator or into Affinity Publisher or whatever else you prefer to use. Um, you're able to do it here. And, and for me, that just means that I'm able to work a lot quicker as well because I don't have to shift back and forth between two programs or wait for typefaces to load or, or any of that stuff. So um, if you're at this point in your typeface, um, I, this is, I think is definitely worth checking out. Um, you know, it's it's been really helpful for me just kind of going through this wait here, uh, just being able to kind of quickly go through and see how everything's uh, looking. Uh, that said, I, I would not say that this would be a replacement for actually putting together a proof and putting it into uh, paragraphs of text and whatnot, but I just wanted to present this as another tool that just kind of helps you make sure that you're covering all of your bases, and uh, heaven forbid you're not forgetting a kerning pair or, you know, uh, it just gives you kind of that nice final pass to make sure everything's looking okay. So, um, yeah, KernCraft, if you haven't, uh, make sure to check that out. It's super handy. But uh, anyway, the one thing that I did want to touch base on, because we had been going through this series and mostly been foc focusing on character design, um, I just kind of wanted to wrap this up by talking about filling out your uh, typeface. So um, we do have the font info thing, and I know I touched base on this uh, originally at the start. So when we started out, we did a regular and a bold master. Um, if I was going to go down the instances route, which I think I had grander plans of at one time for this one, um, you could go through and you could create, so in this case it would be the uh, uh, a weight between the regular and the bold, so maybe I could do a medium or something like that. Um, and this is usually pretty handy uh, if you want to have a multi-weight family or anything like that. Um, it's also good for uh, things like variable fonts if you kind of want a uh, way to, to check quickly and see where things are going. Um, I think in a future uh, series, perhaps, we'll actually explore uh, things like variable fonts, but I, I think that's going to be out of the scope of this episode. Um, there are a few other things, too. You can get into things like features and other settings, uh, poten uh, potentially some notes if you need those. Um, but again, I'm not going to focus on that right now. So typically when I, I start getting to the end, I usually don't name my typefaces probably until the very end. And it's for some type designers, you might ask you know when they come up with a name and, and typically the answer I think you'll find is a lot of times it's towards the end of the typeface. Uh, so one little dirty trick about the type industry is that when you see the name of a typeface usually that name contains letters that the type designer wants to show off and that's in many cases the reasons why they, cho they choose the name that they do. Um, for me personally I think just about every typeface that I've released I've, I've done that to some degree. Um, now, granted, in the past, I, I used to have kind of a theme to the names. I don't really feel compelled to, to stick with that all the time, but um, it is kind of a fun way that if, if anyone's ever going to see this in a setting like Creative Market or My Fonts or Defont or something like that, um, and, and you'll notice this too as you start designing letters, that there are going to be some fun characters that maybe you just really felt stood out or really made the typeface or made it unique or something like that. So. Um, I always recommend if you're stuck on a name, uh, just start kind of playing around with some of the letters you like, uh, and maybe there's a word that, that works for that. Um, that's honestly the secret. It's It sounds a little bit ridiculous, but it's actually pretty true. Um, as far as this one, I actually genuinely don't have a name for it still. Um, I, I think in this case, it's it's been more about the process and actually, you know, what it takes to design a sans serif typeface in this case. Um, and who knows, maybe some point down the line I'll actually come up with, with a name for this. Um, you know, unfortunately, things like YouTube sounds are, are probably going to be off limits here for a variety of reasons. But uh, anyway, it's there you go, new, uh, the family name. As far as the designer, the designer URL, I do like to include both of these. Uh, you just you never really know how your type is going to get out there or what different programs might uh, read as far as uh, the, the type info or anything like that. So I think this is always something that's kind of handy to, to keep nearby. Um, the manufacturer and manufacturer URL, I, that's again, a couple fields that I skip here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you're working with more people on that or a larger team, that might be more appropriate. Uh, maybe to have like a company name or something like that in there. Um, for copyright, it's just typically the year that I made it, which as of the recording, this video is, uh, 2020. 
Um, and then, you know, version one, because what is nice, and, and I've done this in the past too, if you've ever thought about this, but um, there are times where I do go back and revisit old typefaces, even ones that I sell. Um, one good example of that would be on Creative Market, I sell a typeface called Porter, which is a, a loosely Clarendon style um, serifed font. And a lot of people really enjoyed that when I released it, but when I initially released it, I only released it in all caps. Um, However, if you go there now, you'll notice that it actually has uppercase and lowercase uh, as part of the typeface. Um, and so what I did is I think that's like version 1.1 or something like that. But uh, yeah, very similar to software. You can go through and you can version this. So if you're adding new features, if you're fixing things, um, it's just kind of a nice way to, to stay on top of that and you're able to version that. Um, I have seen some people that uh, go a, a route rather than doing the one, two, three, four thing. Um, where they'll do the year and then like the month that it was uh, made. So in this case, uh, for me, again, uh, timing in this video, uh, it's 2020 and um, and it's the eighth month, or whoops, it's August 8th, so make sure I get, there we go. Um, so, you know, do, doing something like this. Um, this is handy. I've done this when I've created software because I don't always remember uh, potentially when I did something specific and I tend to be very date oriented when I uh, say things or do things. Um, so that is one little thing I suppose you could do if you were uh, uh, into that thing. But uh, for the most part, I think most people get by just fine with version 1.0. Uh, we do have the date here, which if I refresh, um, August 6th, 2020. Um, Again, just to kind of help with the versioning and whatnot, um, which kind of goes back to my uh, original thing that I was talking about a little bit, but you can attach the uh, the date that you produced this to your typeface. So it kind of helps you out a little bit there as well if, if you're similar to me with, the, um, with finding the dates on everything. Um, but once you have all this done, what's nice is that you can actually go through and, and it auto saves this as you go here. So I can just simply go and close out of that. And I guess the last thing I will talk about is exporting your type. So um, when you do export out of glyphs, you do have a few options here. Um, you can do an OTF, you can do a UFO, you can just export the metrics. So that would be like your side bearings, your kerning and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is great if you're uh, sharing those across different typefaces. Um, one example that I might think of would be if you were maybe going to do a, a, another typeface that pairs with this. Uh, maybe you're doing like a sans serif and a serif or you're, you know, you have another typeface that maybe has similar proportions to this one and you kind of want a way to, to start at maybe step two instead of step one. You've got those kinds of options. Um, in mine, I do have uh, variable fonts as well. And this depends if I think if you're running the beta version of Glyphs or not, which I usually do run the beta version just because I like to be on the cutting edge of things. Um, but open type uh, variable fonts uh, do require a special export option here. Um, you do not get that when you do the regular OTF. This is just going to give you a standard typeface in one weight only. Um, I'm not really savvy enough to tell you what this one does other than, you know, it does have a special format for variable fonts and uh, allows for multiple weights with all the sliders and everything else. Um, again, outside of the scope of, of this series, but uh, one we can definitely look at a little bit later. And then last but not least, uh, probably what a lot more people are familiar with it than variable fonts, but you do have the option to do a web font here as well. Um, this does give you the option to do open type or true type and then the different uh, file formats that you might need for uh, exporting that to web so you can use it on a website and embed it. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview, but jumping back to the OTF, typically there's a few things that I do here. Um, and this actually kind of keeps my settings here, but uh, I, I tend to keep a, a dedicated uh, export destination. Um, and I, I do organize my font uh, folder a little bit on my computer, so it just kind of helps me identify where I'm dumping my files to. Um, but I do have remove auto la uh, overlap and auto hint here, and I just wanted to touch briefly on a couple of these things. So uh, overlap is an easy one, and if I jump over, let's say to the H here, uh, basically all that's referring to is when I export it, rather than having three pieces like I drew it here, um, it's actually going to go through all of my characters and merge them into one shape. And this is actually something that you want. Um, you don't want to do this for your working files, because if I ever wanted to come back and change this, it would be kind of a pain in the butt, especially if it's a, a, a little bit more complex character than a capital H. Um, 
but it's a handy little thing that Glyphs has in the export menu that you're able to go through and just have it auto merge everything. Um, it really reduces the number of surprises if you didn't check that uh, and you were to uh, import this into something like Illustrator or InDesign. Um, you don't want to have shapes flying all over the place or letters not working, so it's usually best to remove the overlap. Now, as far as the auto hint goes, if you're doing a, a, a typeface that's intended to be used in larger sizes, like a display face or a title face, um, you're not really going to notice much here. But if you're going on smaller sizes, for example, uh, let's say, I think like 16 point or less, um, although someone might might know a little bit more into that than I do, but uh, basically what auto hint does is when you, when you size your typeface down to a certain point, um, eventually, the computer has so many pixels that it can dedicate to the shape of your character and I know this is like super super tiny on my screen but there might be a situation where you need to or where your computer needs to decide you know a stroke that's thinner than one pixel what's it going to do with it and that's when you get into things like anti-aliasing and, and things of that nature but um, in type you know that's hinting so how is it going to handle these super super small sizes um, you know, again, this is a whole science, wrong window here. Um, this is a science, and, and there's a lot of people who are really, really amazing at this kind of stuff. Um, but for the most part, especially if you're just getting started out, auto-hinting is perfectly fine. Um, I, I would say in most cases, that's going to get you across the finish line, uh, especially on higher uh, resolution or denser screens particularly like the new Mac screens or, uh, you know, most modern phones now, I think they have a, a, a pretty high resolution on them. Um, this is becoming less and less of an issue, but particularly back in the day of like the old screens, the old uh, original, I think, LCD screens and all that kind of stuff where pixels were a little bit larger and noticeable on the screen, um, hinting did have a little bit more importance there. But uh, these days, fortunately, that that's getting quite a bit better. So... Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much my settings. If I just go through and hit next, uh, Glyphs exports the typeface, and then I would be able to go to my uh, font folder here, and there we go. I have an OTF file all set, all ready to use in my system. I don't need to uh, run Glyphs or anything like that. I can use this um, as an OTF file wherever I'd like. So. That pretty much wraps up designing a sans serif. And uh, if you followed all the way through this, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for doing so. Uh, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned some things. Um, I can tell you in the, uh, I think it's been, I think, 20 weeks now or something like that, or over 20 weeks that, since I started this. Um, I've certainly learned a lot as well. And um, if you're asking about what's next, I really would like to start another series. I would mentioned this in, in last week's episode. Um, I am open to uh, maybe a different style or, or maybe a specific way of doing things. Um, I do have a few ideas in mind, but I'm also open to suggestions if anybody has anything specific that they would like to see. Um, but to do a little bit of uh, a teasing or foreshadowing, um, I am thinking about switching over to Glyphs Mini for the next series, uh, particularly for those who might have an interest in type design, but maybe you're just not ready to spend a couple hundred dollars yet on the full version of Glyphs. Um, I think it could be kind of fun to explore what you're able to do with the mini version of this um, because it's still a pretty powerful and useful piece of software. Um, but as always, again, the comment section is open if you have any uh, additional thoughts or ideas on that. Um, the other thing that I've been working on and, and have in the works as well is maybe a few uh, just small kind of tidbit videos just going over uh, very specific things or very uh, particular ways of designing or things of, of, of that nature. Um, that I think could be useful as well, particularly for those who might already have an understanding of designing type and maybe are just looking to get more out of the software or maybe to get past a particular problem. So um, again, all that stuff is fair game in the comments section. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we're going to call it a wrap on the Sans Serif. So um, as always, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.